Welcome to Hispanic Heritage Month, our celebration live on Zoom. Corona Premier is proud to be the official sponsor of Hispanic Heritage Month. And now your host, here is George Sedano. Hey, what's up? Welcome into our Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. I'm George Sedano here of ESPN and of course ESPN Los Angeles 710 ESPN in LA. And I'm proud to be uh, joined by two great, great Latinos and uh, icons here in Southern California. We begin with the cultural icon, uh, actor, comedian, George Lopez joining us here. Uh, George, thank you for hanging out, man. There he is, George. How are you, buddy? Thank you, brother. Good to see you, man. Uh, yeah. Respect to you during Hispanic Her Heritage Month. I think every month is Hispanic Heritage Month, but that's just me. Yeah, uh, I, I'm with you. And by the way, thanks to our friends at Corona Premier Absolutely. Uh, for putting this thing together. And of course, Adrian Gonzalez, 15-year MLB vet, uh, former Dodger, Padre, Red Sox, you name it. Uh, one of the best baseball players to play here in Southern California. Adrian, what's up, man? Thanks for joining us. How's it going? How's it going? Yeah, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it. George, great to be on here with you. Let me ask you this. Did you ever think that you look like Ernie from my show? Because I say no. <laughs> man, everybody says it. Hey, I, I own it. I think I do. When I grow up, when, when I don't have the gel and it's a little puffy, there's a resemblance. I said sure. that guy, that guy, I mean, no disrespect. <laughs> this is a professional athlete, a Hall of Fame caliber athlete. <laughs> this I thought was a chubby best friend in a but sitcom and tacos they put like them together. Can. I'm like, they don't belong together. But I, but I can yeah. eat tacos just well, like you know, can, it, it could so. be like if it, <laughs> that's funny. It could be like if it was your, uh, you know, maybe he, he, he could play like, you could play his big brother uh, on, on the show if, uh, if we brought okay. the show back or something. Let me ask uh, you, Adrian. So, so let me ask you this. So, you know, when Vin Scully departed as our announcer, it was a huge thing. Like, and, and I had made friends with him later. But also, you know, growing up in L.A., and when the end of the season, and you even you didn't think of Vin Scully having a family or having a life outside of the Dodgers. But here's a guy that played on some good teams that had, like you played in the intro, the maybe one of the most famous announcers, if not the most famous announcers, call yeah. your games. What's that like? What's that like, A.G.? You know when you go back to the highlights and you hear how he called it, that's when you're like, that's Vince Scully calling it, you know, cause when you're playing, like you don't, you don't hear what's going on in the background and you don't know. And so you're in the moment, you're in the stadium, but when you go back and you, and, and you play some of the replays and you hear how he called the game or how he called that play or that at bat or whatever, it's amazing. I mean, just a living legend. Uh, you know, he's just, he's incredible. I, I think he's the greatest of announcer of all time. So. You know, when I was a kid growing up, and occasionally, maybe once a season, maybe once every two seasons, you maybe had field box seats. So me and my friend Ernie would go on a Sunday. Maybe there wasn't as many people on a Sunday game with a team that wasn't as good at that particular time of the season. And we were sitting, the, at that point, you could walk out on the field from the middle of the fence, and we heard somebody whistling, and we turn around, and in a one-piece jumpsuit, powder polyester blue with the belt that connects to the front this red hair and this dude whistling and Vince Scully goes hi young man and we're like wow and he just went down to the field to check it out before the game and he's in this like Elvis thing man one piece zipper and white buckskin loafers and I mean that was you know he was the man for all of the times, like that's how you yeah. that's how you threw down in the seventies. Yeah, George, let me ask you this, and Adrian, I'd like to get your thoughts as well. Like, you know, we're all sports fans. I work in sports. You know, Adrian, you played. George, you're a huge sports fan. You're at Dodger games. You're at Laker games. You're everywhere. Where did it start, though? The love for sports was it? Was there a lot of sports in your Latino household? Well, you know, I'm not a professional athlete, but you know, my grandfather and I, well, he was not my biological grandfather. And I didn't even really know that he loved baseball. And I remember one day we were playing with the guys I played Little League with on a Friday. And this car pulls up. And it's him and my grandmother. And they say, get in. And I get in. I said, where are we going? We never really did anything much as a family. And we're driving down the 5 freeway past where I live right now. And then we come over to Legion Park. And you see this thing that just looks like it was the most beautiful thing I'd, I'd ever seen. 
the biggest thing I'd ever seen. And this this Dodger Stadium with that ball and the thing. And we went to the game. I had no idea he was he was taking us to the game. And I'm going to tell you that it was the only thing that we did as a family was go to the games. Um, and from 66 to 88, that's what we did as a family was go to Dodger games. Adrian? Uh, for me, it's, I mean, it was in Tijuana with, with my, you know, my, my dad played baseball. My two older brothers played baseball. So when I was born, when I came out of the womb, it was like, <laughs> man, you're playing baseball, you know? So it was, uh, I, I, I always tell people I had no choice. Uh, yeah. You know, we spent Saturdays and Sundays on the baseball field when, whether, you know, it was my brother's doubleheaders, my dad's games. Uh, we always had the carnesada after the games, after my dad's games, because he, he ran the team that he played on. Uh, he was like a player coach in, in, in that league. It's like a Sunday ball, but it's a very high level Sunday ball. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so he would always have the carnesadas afterwards and, and we would just hang out. At the, we would literally be at least on Sundays from like 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. In, in the, you know, Liga Municipal de Tijuana, right there in Otay, well, uh, in, 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 in Tijuana. Let me ask you this. When was the moment that you realized to yourself or to your family or whenever that you were going to be a professional baseball player? Like, where were you when somebody said, man, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be a baseball player? You know what? Uh, you know, we always all had this passion. My dad was really good. He was asked to go play professional baseball many a times. Uh, he, he's kind of like a, a little legend in, in the amateur uh, leagues. He holds like a bunch of records. And so my dad's dream for any of us, all his kids was to be a professional baseball player um, because the opportunities he had, he had to turn down because the money that he was offered to go play professionally in Mexico was so little that he was making more money in his job. <laughs> and so his dream was for us to be professional baseball players. And um, I would say to answer your question, George, I would say uh, junior year of high school, before the baseball season started, I quit football. I was a quarterback in football. And I quit football so I could go play, so I can focus 100% on baseball. And I just went straight into the weights, and I started doing a ton of weights. And at the end of my junior year of high school, I was invited to, uh, to this tournament called the Area Code Games, and where they bring in all, all, a bunch of uh, high school players from all over, all over the U.S. And, and when I went to that tournament, and I, 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 I had a really good tournament, I had all these scouts come to me in colleges, and that's kind of where, like, everything started. And at that point, I knew I would get drafted. I didn't know if I was going to get to the major leagues, but I knew I would get drafted at some point. Uh, I didn't know what round, I didn't know where, but I knew I would be drafted to go play professional baseball at that point. I mean, and, it's, it's amazing. I mean, to think, to think that, I mean, you look at players, like I was fortunate enough to see, I saw Roberto Clemente play at Dodger Stadium, and I've seen, you know, I went to Fernando Mania, yeah. and even guys that weren't Latinos were big successes with Latinos. Ron Say and, you know, Lopes and yeah. Jaeger and Steve Garvey. Like, we love those guys. And it wasn't about being Latino. We just love the team. So anybody that's a Dodger, win or lose is always kind of, you know, is always a legend in L.A. It's a, it's a privilege to play in L.A. Let me ask you a question. Why, Adrian, you know, why do you think more Mexicans don't play baseball? I mean, clearly soccer is the big sport in Mexico. I understand that. But it feels like all the Mexican players that I've seen play, even most recently, we saw Julio Urias yesterday, right? Three scoreless yeah. innings. Like, they're, they excel at the sport. Why isn't it more popular down there? Um, it is very popular. The, the one thing you got to re remember, baseball is not a sport you can just pick up and play. Right. Soccer, you can get a ball, you just get an area, and you just go play. Right. Baseball, you need a bat, you need gloves, you need a field, you need, you, know, you need a lot of things. And so, you know, when you, when, you, when you put all those factors in, not everybody has the ability to play baseball, but everybody has the ability to play soccer. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, when you're growing up, you're going to play more soccer because that's what you're going to do in the neighborhood. And so you're going to develop a, a bigger love. The other thing, too, is that, you know, the number one televised sport in Mexico is soccer. So everybody's watching soccer, you know. And so when you watch soccer, you, 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 you get to – follow somebody and you look up to somebody and you want to be like that person. You know, for me, it was Tony Wynn growing up in San Diego. I wanted to be like Tony Wynn, you know, in Mexico, they're going to have their, th those people they want to be, but, be but because they're watching soccer, they're going to think, think of soccer players. Uh, you know what, that, that is an excellent answer to an incredible question. You know, when I, in the, in the early eighties, I was dating somebody that had friends that lived in, uh, Calexico or the other side of the border and we went to some baseball games and John Crook 
was playing in Mexico before in he went to the Padres. And this guy was incredible, man. Such a great swing and just such an amazing player, a standout player. And then he became, you know, he played for the Padres. He was John Cruck. But you're like, wow, man. So, you know, the Mexican leagues have these guys that are playing and then they become major leaguers on the highest level of baseball. And then you're seeing them play in a field where in between innings, they let kids run out on the field and get autographs or take pictures or have you sign a ball. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I also feel like when, when you look at like Latinos, right? Like, you know, you guys are Mexican, I'm Cuban. I, we're all different. You know what I mean? And I think that, you know, most people who aren't, Latino don't understand that. Like they don't understand that, oh, Cubans are this way, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Mexicans, whatever. But, but we do have a lot of things in common, right? Which is like family. I think family and, and get togethers, right? Like that is a common thread with Latinos, you know, whether it's it, you know, watching sporting events together, whether it's, you know, birthday parties or events and things like that. Um, what are your first memories though uh, of just being young and, and just like being part of the family. And, and honestly, this part too, like focusing on speaking English, because I grew up in a, in a household where my parents both work uh, multiple jobs. And I went, I was at the house talking to me in Spanish, you know what I'm saying? So I didn't learn to speak English until I was watching Sesame Street. But like for you guys kind of growing up, like what was, what was that like? Just kind of the indoctrination of just being Latino in, in the areas you grew up? Well, you want to say that, you know, you know, Currently, Corona Premier has a lot to do with it. But also, you know, it's the sports and the food, like carne asada after a game. And it's the camaraderie that brings everybody together, win or lose. It wasn't really about winning or losing. It was about playing and your performance. So the issue with the family was that, you know, win or lose, they were your harshest critics. Yes. But also, they were your biggest fans. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, my, my one time, we, I, I, I never won a championship in baseball, and I played my whole life. And the first year that, I, that they wanted me to play catcher when I was seven, I was a tough-to-deal-with player. The guy sent me down, and I think almost castigo. Like, I got uh, – uh, 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 the Lord said, this guy's never going to win a championship in baseball. And it was the thing I chased the most. Also, right now, with kids like – you know, everybody winning and everybody getting a trophy. When we didn't win, I wasn't so much hurt as I wanted to be better the next year. Right. And I think that's what makes kids right now a little less aggressive in a sport, or not even aggressive, but yet a little going right. down the line is that it's okay not to win. We wanted to win, but if we didn't win, I didn't feel like a loser. I just felt like I needed to get better. Yeah. Um, for me, my, my, my memories are just, you know, like George said here, you know, carne asadas, being with the family, um, always, you know, one thing that, that brings families, at least for, for me and, and my family. And I know with my wife and her family, it's always making fun of each other. Like that's one of the things that <laughs> yes. always happens. Yes. Always yeah. happened across, yeah. I, I, from what I've seen across Latino household. Yeah you always make fun of each other, no matter what it is. Like for me, it's my ears. Like they won't <laughs> let me go because of my ears, right? You got to pick yeah. something of that person. And, um, but it's all, it's all in good fun. And like George said, they're your biggest critics and they're your biggest fans at the same but time. But you know, that, that, you know when we love. started to, when I did my first show and they said to me, you know, is there anything that, you know, people used to make fun of you? And this is like in a building at Warner Brothers with just three of us. Yeah. Is there anything that they used to make fun of you about? And I'm like, uh, you know, they used to call me spuds because I was the color of a potato. <laughs> and they used to talk about how big my head was. And both of those were in the show. And they, they become almost endearing things where, where in the, as a kid, it hurt you. Yeah. In the show, yeah. they become endearing things. Cabezon, big head, yeah. papa, yeah. spuds. They just become kind of, Things that let you know people love you. They're thinking about you. I would imagine. I, I always, I always get that. Hey, check, check the satellites. Is there any rain in the forecast? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> satellite. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, no doubt. Um, George, I would imagine though that kind of helped form not necessarily just your act, but just like it formed you as a comedian in in a lot of ways. Just like being able to have that interaction within the household made it more natural for you on stage, I would imagine. You know, I, the, the guy, this guy, Arnold Velos, is still my friend. 
I was the best man at his wedding. He married this incredible woman. They're still married 40 plus years. And it was known that at any party when her father had had too much to drink, he wanted to sing. So he would say, la corta la musica. And he would just stand there and, and he would be crying and he would be singing. And we would know, all right, all right. He's had way too much to drink. But it was those things and the fact that you created midnight during the day. It didn't have to be midnight to have a party full swing. It could have been three in the afternoon. It could have been a baptism when all the kids run over and all the kids. But those are the things that formed our wanted to make you better, brought family together, yeah. and are your are now your best memories. I mean, I created a career yeah. career out of talking about how things were and how you wish they were kind of still that way. George, let me ask you this in regards to just the entertainment business, right? Because we've spent a lot of time talking about sports, but you know, there's a there's so many guys like yourself who blazed the trail, right? And even before you, right? A guy like Freddie Prince uh, blazed the trail. I mean, Freddie Prince Jr. is actually a friend of ours here at the station. He's on the station all the time. Like, who were the people that inspired you to get to the heights that you were at? I think you look at, I think you look at Cuban, you got to look at Desi Arnaz. I mean, you know, this is a true story. This is crazy, man. So in the, in the early 90s, I did a show at Walnut Creek. I opened for Bob Hope, the, uh, the woman I ended up marrying, Anne worked at a production company. They were doing the thing and Bob Hope was the headliner. And I opened for Bob Hope and I got a call at the Doubletree Hotel in Walnut Creek and said, Bob Hope wants you to ride with him to the theater. And then the way over, he didn't say a word to me. And on the way back, he hit the light and it came down on his nose. And he's like, what do you think of that crowd last night? I said, you know, I thought they were a little bit slow in the beginning. I thought you got them, you know? And then afterwards he says, come and have a drink with me. And he sat and he told me that Desi Arnaz was a mastermind, a brilliant creator, an incredible producer, owned his own studio and created the way that we shoot sitcoms today and that everybody discounted him because he had an accent, but that he was brilliant. And be only because he had an accent, people thought he wasn't smart. And we still almost to this day look at somebody's accent and think that maybe they're not, you know, on the level, but it's on the level and beyond. Yeah, for sure. Adrian, did you ever run into any of that in sports? Like, I feel like in, in, in just in any walk of life, right? Like people get put into boxes, right? Um, what, did you ever encounter some of that going up in, in through the ranks in major league or getting to major league baseball? Um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, it's, it's hard to say because you have a lot of, a lot of Latino players come in, just, and you know, they sign hundreds every year to go to the minor leagues. And then from there, it's like, and so there's always this like, oh, it's just another Latino signed here. And so like, you know, you get, they, a lot of times they get dismissed um, just because, you know, there's 50 rounds in the U.S. for baseball, but then yet they sign a hundred Latinos because they can sign them, you know, pennies on the dollar. Right. And so, um, so you, you see a lot of that. You see a lot of, you know, people, they, I remember when, you know, first, first signed, I was fortunate, like I was the first overall pick. And so I was fortunate to, to get to the minor leagues pretty secure, but you see these Latinos that would make $700 paycheck and they didn't really sign for anything. And they would take $400 of that and send it home and then just, you know, try to scrap for food. And it's like, how can you try and be the best athlete you can be on this small paycheck? And so it's hard to compete with, with the people that have families that can support them. And it's hard to stay at that level and be able to perform because they're, they're having to go and buy, you know, 99 cent food at the gas station to, right. to, to train and then your body, feeling your body with that stuff. So it's, it's it, the, the playing ground is not level. Now it's starting to get better because the teams are actually starting to supply quality food to in the clubhouses. Um, but I know for me, you can ask, you know, one of the guys that, um, that I, I, I came up with was Miguel Cabrera. And Miguel Cabrera was able to sign for a good paycheck as well. So me and Miguel would take all the Latinos every day to eat. Every day after practice, after the game, we would, we would take That's them awesome. on. We would just go eat. And we would all, even when we played in rookie ball together, we played in A-ball together. And, I mean, we were able to, to make sure that the people that were around us were able to eat well and not have to worry about how much can I send home and this and that. But – um, you do see that a lot as far as not, you know, the discrimination and all that's there, but it's more about just being able to be on the same playing field when, you, when you're trying to get there. 
Now, so, so you- let me say this. So when I was starting out, we don't have any money. We're opening acts or middle acts. And the headliner is the guy that they used to have a joke, you know, today I went with the headliner to the mall and watched him shop. That was the, that was the guy that was making money. So I would work with a guy that would take me and I really kind of wasn't really ready for him to put me in the, in the position that he put me in, which was right before him. And he kind of took me under his wing. And then during the day, we would go and have lunch and he would always pay. And I, I didn't really have a lot of money, but he would always pay. And he would say to me, when you're a headliner, then you pay. But right now I'm a headliner and I pay. And then you, you teach that down the way. And when I would always have guys with me, I would say, I'm going to pay. But when you do this, like Adrian said, then you, then you pay. You know, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, you're right. You got to pay that stuff forward for sure. Um, and we know Adrian's story, right? Because you told us about, you know, the lineage that you had as far as the athletes and the baseball players. But, George, I'm curious about you because I, I can only speak from my own experience. When I told my mom and dad uh, who, you know, fled Cuba in the 60s that I wanted to be a broadcaster, you know, he was like, pero que coño? Yo vine este país. I came to this country, you know, and fled communism for you to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, and I was making 18 grand in my first job in 2000. And he thought I was crazy. Um, like, what was that conversation like when you wanted to be an entertainer in your family? Well, my grandfather wasn't biological. My grandmother was maternal. And then when I was 18, I went and did stand up. I kind of kept it a little bit of a secret. And then I would have, and then my grandfather would tell me, vas a decir mentiras as I was leaving, you know, at 5.30 to go to the comedy store <laughs> to be there by eight, you're gonna go tell lies. He died in 88. And, uh, you know, he was really hard on me, man. He was not uh, a person that ever said like, you know, you stick to your dreams and you stick to your convictions and you can make it. But he gave me what he could give me and it was an encouragement. But the fact that he would say, vas a, vas a decir mentiras, made me take that and say, you know what, I'm going to show you what my lies can get me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to show you where, where my lies can take me. Right. So whether somebody is in a position where you have family that's encouraging you or whether you're like me and I have a star in the Walk of Fame and a wax figure and this all of the whole thing and they don't encourage you, it's not, it's not me it's the perception of me. I'm not me yet, but it's me walking out the door that they say, Vas a decir mentiras. but you don't know where I'm going to end up in 15, 20 years. Like, I, I, like what Adrian said, like all these guys get signed. Like you, you can't think it's not going to be you. You have to think it's going to be you and never really not think it's like, I never expected that level of success, but I always felt different than everybody else. Not better just just different so I wouldn't say that there was a uh, an incredible amount of opportunities I created my own opportunity because when you're good like they would say the cream rises to the top when you have a swing like Adrian Gonzalez and you have a glove like that guy like you're gonna find your way to the top and when you're a guy like me that's in the clubs and you're always funny and this and that they're gonna find you was there a moment though that you said I've arrived Man, I mean, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know, man, there's, there's I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them, you know, there's, you know, I, I had performed at the Ice House and the president of ABC was there and the president of Warner Brothers was there and I, we talked afterwards and they said, we'll call you tomorrow. And I was on a plane, I just landed in Houston, I was going to go do the comedy zone in Houston and I have this, you know, uh, town car picked me up and I'm in the backseat by myself and the phone rings and I go, hello. And it's Bruce Helford who did Drew Carey. It's like, you're sitting down. I said, yeah, man, I'm in the car. He goes, congratulations, man. You just got a TV show. ABC picked up the show. It's going to go to air. We're not going to write a pilot. It's going to go to the air. I said, oh my God, you start crying. And the drivers I said, hey man, I just got a television show on ABC. That dude didn't say congratulations. He didn't say that. He just, just driving like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian, what, that's awesome. That's awesome. Adrian, what about you, man? You know, you talked about you, you felt that, you know, you, you felt like you were going to get drafted, but what was that first moment where you're like, man, I've arrived? Like, was it your first major league game? Like, what, how, could you, how would you describe that moment, whatever it was? Um, it's hard to say. I think, I think, I think a, a lot of it is like George says, you just keep grinding. Like, you just keep working and you just keep 
pressing. And then before you know it, you're like, all right, I think I'm good now. Like, I, I know I'm in a good spot now, you know? It's like, you don't really have that moment where it's like, okay, now I'm here, I'm good to go now. Like, maybe for me, it would be like after my first full season with the Padres that, you know, I was like, okay, now I know I'm not getting sent down anymore. Right. Um, but it doesn't take away the fact that you just got to keep working and you just got to keep keep doing things because, um, you know, it's, it's like, the minute you stop, somebody else is there right behind you to take over. And so it's like, you, you never really look back. You just keep going. And you know, you know, I was, I was sick during my show. I had a kidney disease and I, and I did not want to kind of pull the cord and say, Hey, you guys, you know what? I'm sick. I need to take a little time off. I said, I'm not going to tell. I told my main two guys, we didn't tell ABC. We didn't tell Warner Brothers. I said, Hey man, I'm sick. I have kidney disease. I'm going to keep working. If it becomes an issue, I'm going to let you know but I'm not going to stop the show. I'm not going to cancel production because like, like a, a, you know, Lou Gehrig, man, it's like that, that other dude, Wally Pip says like, yeah, I, I can't yeah, play today. Yeah, and yeah. then th 4,000 games later, that dude never played. So I was like, yeah. you know what, man, I'll, I'll die doing this because I know yeah. that if I say I'm out, then I'm out. Like you're, they're not going to bring you back. Yeah. So I was, you know, nobody knew the depths of my illness. And I wasn't going to die, but I mean, I didn't, I wasn't a normal, I didn't have the energy of a normal person, but also, you know, we go to work sometimes when we don't feel good. I've had the joke where we go, you know, we don't go to work when we feel good, but we'll go when we feel bad. Like, yeah. like Hey man, you yeah. wake up and you go, you know what? I feel too good to go to work today, but, but you'll go hung over. So I said like, I didn't, I wasn't fit, but, but, you would have you would have had to have, have drug me away from that show to get it to stop because I knew that if it stopped, it wasn't going to come back. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's part of like, ingrained in our culture too as Latinos, right? Like we saw our parents, you know, and grandparents, you know, bust their ass basically, right, to just be to put whatever they could on the table for us. I think all that stuff right. is really ingrained in us, you know. So you know, there, yeah. there's stories. There's great stories, like you know, uh, Adrian's a great so Oscar De La Hoya. You look at, I mean. You look at Fernando Valenzuela, who lives around here, and then you think that this guy comes to L.A., and my grandmother worked nights, and I remember one morning when I got up, there was a T-shirt and a button on top of this desk, and I'm like, where did this come from? And my grandmother said that a guy was walking through the factory selling Fernando Valenzuela T-shirts and buttons. That's how popular this dude was in L.A., that at factories they were selling <laughs> t-shirts and buttons and hats of this guy like yeah. really yeah. yeah if you look yeah. at muhammad ali and if you look at you know uh people that at, they admire on the highest level the this guy was a he should be in the hall of fame i agree and the fact that he's not is an insult to every latino who's played baseball and every Latino who's performed in any profession at the highest level. Well, I'll tell you this real quick, just to interject here. His first start, the 40th anniversary, was a little over a week ago. And I was stunned, right? Like, we were talking about it on the radio show a little bit. And I was stunned. Nothing by the Dodgers. Nothing by the LA Times. Like, I was – nothing on the local news. I was, I was a little surprised that that was the case. It's insulting, man. It's awful. Yeah. It's yeah. Awful. yeah. It is. It, it you know, really that, that's – I mean, you know, it's just – it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, when you look at a person like, you know, no disrespect to Don Drysdale or Sandy Koufax or Bob, uh, 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 Bob Singer or, you know, Claude Osteen or Urshizer. Yeah. But Fernando's with Oral Urshizer. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's like that. I mean, he came through not only as a pitcher, but as a batter. And as he pinch hit, I mean, this dude, yeah. he'd like do anything. Yeah. And, and the jacket. And when, and when people, and when people <laughs> went to the game, you love the team already, but he just didn't inspire that team. He inspired as far as that reach was. You know, Adrian and guys like me that probably just like, he was, just, that's when you have a real person that makes a difference, like a hero. Yeah. And for not sure. just a player. No doubt about it. Um, you know, speaking of which, you know, the, there's a lot of talk with the Lakers in the finals, kind of uh, the, the unfortunate tragedy of Kobe kind of inspiring them a lot. Uh, I'm sure you guys have been, a, were, had been around him plenty over the years. Um, you know, what do you make of this run and everything that, that's happening and, 
and how the Lakers have been able to kind of get through all of that, right? Like the emotions of just playing a season is hard enough. Um, but having to deal with that on top of it, Adrian, I'll start with you. I think, you know, like you said, I mean, you know, um, you know, when unfortunate things and tragedies happen and if it hits a club so deep, it creates a bond within the team. And I think that's something that, that, that happened here. I think, you know, this team created a bond around that and they're playing harder than maybe they would have because of that. And it's unfortunate that um, obviously, you know, the tragedy happened and, and, and Kobe's passing is just, you know, one of the saddest things, you know, that's, you know, ever happened in Southern California. Um, and it's just, it's, but, it, but it does create that bond. I mean, you, you know, you saw it with the Red Sox after the marathon bombing, um, you know, there, there's, there's just so many times uh, that you see these type of things create a bond within the team. And then because of that, they were to play at a higher level. Well, you know that, uh, uh, you know, he was an Eagles fan. He was from Philadelphia. He threw out the first pitch at Dodger Stadium. And, you know, he was one of us, man. Five rings, 10 years after the last ring, this incredible uh, year that's been going on. And, you know, I knew him personally and the family from way back. And if, uh, if there was a way to honor one of the most devastating things that has ever happened in life and sports and to people and to other families that if they won this year uh, and the Dodgers won this year, I mean, it's just, it would just bring, I mean, just listen at a tough time, man. It would bring tears of, of joy and people together and love. And, you know, if I saw Adrian golfing, we'd hug each other and be like, Hey man, <laughs> you know, we did it, man. Like, you know, it's like that, like it's yeah. that, like that here, you know, yeah. and that's what LA, you know, listen, Boston's great. Miami's awesome. New York with all the championships, but there's something about, I think Adrian will tell you something about playing in LA that is, is just different. Yeah. Yeah, and, and man, listen, I want to thank you guys because our time is up here uh, for taking the time here on Hispar Hispanic Heritage Month <laughs> and our special, man. Uh, George, Adrian, thank you guys again, That's man. Awesome. Appreciate it, okay? You guys thank stay you. healthy. Thank yeah, right you. on, man. Stay thank safe. You. All right, and thanks again to our friends at Corona Premier. And thank you all for tuning in as well. Hope you guys enjoyed it and continue celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. Thanks I'll again. See you later, guys. AG. Okay. See you in a little bit. <laughs> Bye, guys. Take care. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah.